licensed to prescribe and treat in primary care and specialized in neurology and movement disorders. She has more than 30 years experience in caring for individuals with Parkinson's disease. She practices at uh, Lakeside NeuroCare in Fond du Lac and is an inpatient medical consultant to acute neurological conditions such as stroke and seizure at St. Agnes Hospital or Oshkosh and Mercy Medical Center in Oshkosh. Daisy's clinical practice specializes in the diagnosis and treatment of individuals with Parkinson's disease. Prior to joining Lakeside, she was a nurse practitioner at the regional Parkinson's Center in Milwaukee. During her 18 years with the Parkinson Center, she was co-founder of the Parkinson Research Institute, developing its lifespan database and brain bank procurement program. And she has also held the position of education outreach coordinator for Wisconsin Parkinson Association. She's author of multiple manuscripts on uh, Parkinson's disease, is certified as a research coordinator by the Association of uh, Clinical Research Professionals, and has managed more than 30 per pharmaceutical studies using experimental therapeutic agents, many approved for use today. Please join me in welcoming Daisy Reimer. Thank you, Gary. That was a mouthful. <laughs> I am really thrilled that you're all here with me today because it really shows that you have an interest in your health and that you're being proactive. I think in healthcare, we talk a lot about medicine, about treatment. Um, every one of my patients worries about prognosis. And uh, even yesterday, I had one of my patients come in and say, what do I have to look ahead? You know, what, and I always say, well, I don't have a crystal ball, but I can tell you that the people who are proactive in their health, such as exercise, as well as their nutrition, do better. They do a lot better. And that's, that's anecdotal. That's something that's really observation of doing this for many years. So, uh, and you hear a lot about exercise, and I absolutely am an advocate for exercise, but we talk very little about nutrition and what you should do proactively to promote brain health. It's not uncommon that we kind of go about doing the same thing until you've had a stroke, you've had a heart attack, or you become diabetic. Then you start getting dietary counseling to try to improve that, even though you already had it, right? Uh, when people do decide to change their lifestyle or change their diet, say they're diabetic, um, they kind of almost hang their hat on that diagnosis and it's very overwhelming. The research that shows that we can really change the course of our brain health, and especially with memory. What I wanted to kind of cover with you initially is, why do I care about this? This is something that I really, really believe in personally, as well as in my practice, and it's something that not only do I prescribe and treat Parkinson's disease, but I try to do a lot of kind of health coaching in lifestyle changes so that um, we can improve cognition, we can improve brain health, and hopefully ward off dementia. I don't know about you, but I don't want it. Okay, I've seen it a lot. I've watched aging my whole career. I've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly. I don't want dementia. So probably about five years ago, I thought, I need to investigate this more. And when I started researching, it was really confusing. There's the keto diet. There's, I mean, it's just crazy out there on the different types of diet plans. And a lot of that is industry-based, you know, and pushed. What I really wanted to know is, how can I improve my own cognition and brain function? And is there evidence out there that proves that we can uh, help to ward off dementia, Alzheimer's disease. And so that's really where I started. I'm a researcher. 
Uh, I'm, I'm not a fad diet person. If I'm going to have to give up bread or sweets, there better be some evidence for it, you know? It better be real. There better be a lot of proof before I do that, because I really like bread, <laughs> okay? So um, I'm, I'm not one to, I've never been one to just hop on a diet. And many people have, though. They've tried it for weight loss or various reasons. Um, but for me, I was really looking to just, I was looking forward as I'm 50, heading into my other years, I, I'm going, how is it that I can improve and, and sustain what I have and looking forward, maintain my brain health? The other issue was looking at my patients. I have many patients that I've known and seen for many years who follow me from the, our practice in Milwaukee and I see now. I have one fella in particular that I think of, and he's brilliant. He's an engineer. And just, you know, you, you get this relationship with your, with your patients, and you get to know who they are. This man's absolutely brilliant. And I've watched him over the years decline mentally. We've done, we pulled out all the stops. We've done everything we can treatment-wise to try to sustain it and improve it. Um, but recently his wife retired and her job is taking care of him because he's really declined mentally. And it's a huge burden. She thought the golden years were gonna be golden, okay? So um, it's, it's hard even for me to watch that decline. And I think to myself, is there something else I'm missing? Is there something else I should be doing in my clinical practice that I could be doing better and educating my patients that we could be controlling. And hopefully you'll see as I kind of go through some data today that there is. And a lot of it is about our nutrition. I don't like to say diet because most of you go, ooh, you know, been there, done that, um, success or failure. And so uh, that's kind of the, the background for it. When I started that the nutritional changes myself in my own lifestyle. I started probably at least about five years ago. And I have rheumatoid arthritis. And I was probably every three or four months needing prednisone to try to be able to brush my teeth in the morning or get out of bed and walk because I had so much inflammation. I haven't had prednisone in three years. I don't know why that is, but the only thing I've changed is my lifestyle. And there is evidence to show that when you decrease uh, the anti-inflammatory effects of the food in your body, that you can decrease the inflammation. So to me, I, I really do believe in it. That's not why I did it. I really did it because I don't want dementia. Uh, but I feel that in my own life that I've had an added benefit from it. Um, let me just get to my slides here. So, you know, in the last few decades, there's been a lot of research. Um, a lot of it is into Alzheimer's disease, uh, but there's also a lot of research in Parkinson's disease. Um, the advances in nutrition and that link to disease, such as um, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, uh, ADHD, depression, and there, there's a lot of proof out there that making a lifestyle change can improve those disease processes. Um, I think that in my own clinical practice, I don't know, how many of you have ever talked about nutrition with your provider? Raise your hand. It's better than what I expected, good. But um, if you haven't, a lot of times I think it's because there's no real time in the visits. Right? We're talking about medications and other things, and those definitely are, if, if there's falls, that's a priority and things, but there are times when things are smooth sailing, and that's when our job is to be talking about exercise and nutrition and sleep, like Dr. Leo was talking about, and those other uh, things that we can change lifestyle-wise to improve some of, uh, some of the symptoms that we're having. Most of you know, if you go to a restaurant and you've eaten 
you know, if you've been out to a fish fry, you come home, you're kind of bloated, you might not even feel that good, might have some gut effects on you, might not be as clear in thinking and things. I always tell my patients, you can't change the oil, uh, not change the oil in your car or vehicle for 10 years and expect it to run well. Same with our bodies. When we eat cleaner, we eat fresher, our bodies function um, more efficiently. It, according to the American Medical Association, it takes 17 years before data becomes clinical practice. And I think that's huge because right now there's a lot of data out there about inflammation in the brain and its cause uh, and Parkinson's dementia and also in Alzheimer's disease that we don't have guidelines on nutrition. And if it takes 17 years to put that into practice, and I'll be honest, I think it takes longer than that because we're not really good in healthcare at actually even having that discussion with our patients unless they've already had something wrong with them. So I think that it takes even longer before any of those uh, nutritional guidelines are actually put into place. So my goal with my practice, and I didn't do this years ago, I didn't even think of this years ago, is really to take that data that's out there, but it isn't mainstream. It isn't mainstream in neurology. It isn't mainstream in necessarily in movement disorders. It's not even mainstream in primary care. And take that data and make sure that I'm applying it and educating my patients. Part of that is because it gives you a positive focus also on your health. Because when you get the diagnosis, you kind of have this idea that this is a downhill swing. Oh, but then I can exercise. But nutrition will even uh, enhance that more. So you have to have, you have to be able to control some of this, right? You don't have to give it all up to Parkinson's disease. And hopefully when you see the data and the proof, you'll take it very seriously. The fact that you're here today, you're taking it very seriously. So I really appreciate you being here. So, in 2019, the National Institute of Health, or the NIH, um, did a big study called the Human Biome Project. And in this study, um, they, you can look this up online and things too, um, the basic idea behind it, and it's very complicated, is that there's more of a connection between your brain and your gut than you think. I think a lot of times, especially in neurology or any other specialty, we focus in, we're looking at the brain. That's all we're looking at. We, you know, there's actually a vagus nerve that runs up and a lot of that inflammation follows that. And so uh, when we're talking about that connection, you might think, well, how in the world would your gut connect to your brain? But we can't really break it apart. You know, we really have to take a look at um, the cause and effect. And uh, 89, or 70 to 80% of your immune system is actually in your gut. So diet optimizes this microbiome. And some of the things that we're gonna talk about are prebiotics, you may not even have heard of that before, probiotics, healthy fats, uh, gluten-free, and also antioxidants. So this is a little bit maybe overcomplicated picture for, uh, for you know, people in general. The whole idea here is that, how many of you have ever heard of alpha synuclein? Yeah, so it's, it's very scientific. There's a complicated explanation, but um, when we have increased inflammation in our body, um, in the brain, it causes alpha synuclein to aggregate and accumulate what's called Lewy bodies in the brain. With Alzheimer's disease, you've probably heard of plaques and tangles. So those are, those are tau protein plaques and beta amyloid uh, tangles. And those, there's a lot of research on, on uh, inflammation in the body, as well as a link to diabetes and Alzheimer's disease. So in my practice, like I said, my goal is that I'm trying to be able to assess the foods that cause more inflammation. Okay, and decrease those so that it, uh, the body has a lesser inf inflammatory response. In my case, with my, with my rheumatoid arthritis, 
make sense that it got better, but I, like I said, I just didn't, I just didn't expect that. So I wanted to talk real briefly. Has anybody heard of the blue zones? Yeah, good. We actually have, you know, one here in Dodge County in Wisconsin. So they're actually, uh, I didn't even know what I was speaking for the Alzheimer's Association and I was walking into the building and there's a sign and, um, and it said that they were a blue zone community and I didn't even know that they had a blue zone community here in Wisconsin. So apparently I didn't do enough research, um, but I have since then and I kind of follow them on Facebook too. So blue zones, oh, and I wanted to add really briefly that Dan Buettner, uh, the creator of this Blue Zone project, is actually related to Gary, which I didn't know until one of my talks, uh, I think, last year. So he's actually a relative of Gary's. So uh, Dan was a, or is a reporter uh, for National Geographic, correct? And uh, so he basically, in a lot of his travels around the world, and found that there are these pockets that have people with excellent health and longevity. And thought, well, why in the world is that? Why do they, what do they do that's different than what we do, right? And when I talk about longevity, these are very, these are centurions, and these are people who uh, live many, many years, long years into their 90s, but they're healthy. They don't have the diabetes, they don't have depression, they don't have the heart disease that we have, especially uh, here in the United States. So the Blue Zone Project, and you can go online to the Blue Zone Project, was created to investigate that further. And they've basically ad identified these five areas um, initially uh, that are, are designated as Blue Zones. And so the investigation was into why, why them? What are they doing? And um, there are many factors to it. It's not just nutritional. It's social. Um, one of the things I say to people is, our goal here is to keep you independent, right? I want to be independent as long as possible. I don't want to be reliant on anybody else. And so you got to wake up every morning with purpose. You can't just retire and quit, right? you got to have purpose every morning when you wake up. And, uh, and it doesn't mean just mowing the lawn, right? So, um, yeah, you have jobs to do. You have your honeydew list. But you have to feel like you are here and have something to contribute to society. And one of the many things that these uh, areas all have in common is uh, that they really kind of don't retire. They just keep, a lot of them say they're busier now than what they were when they were working. I actually happened upon a program called Wanderlust, and I like travel programs because I love to travel. And um, he ended up going uh, to uh, Icaria, Greece. Icaria is actually the way it's pronounced. Icaria, and um, was interviewing people and talking about the Blue Zone, so I was kind of excited I had to watch it. And one lady that he interviewed, she was selling, you know, kind of at a farmer's market, and he said, well, why are you still doing this? And she goes, because it's my purpose. You know, it's why I get up every day. She said the biggest mistakes that, the mistake that Americans make is retiring. And it makes sense. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense that you have to have something that you really enjoy doing. So um, these areas, like I said, they, the commonalities with them is that, um, that the area in their community is a five mile radius. Um, they have accessibility. So they have areas that they can walk. You know, think about it with uh, your, the area that you live in. Can you get out? Can you walk trails? Can you, or do you feel confined space-wise? You know, you've got to be able to get out in nature. You've got to be able to walk um, perhaps to a neighbor's house and have that accessibility and community accessibility. Uh, biking, hiking, um, social involvement, volunteerism. Uh, they have intergenerational care. So it's a lot about family, young family helping to take care of old. The uh, elderly are helping to babysit the young. So a lot of that, that energy, that's purpose, right? Any of you, I'm a grandma. I have three grandkids. I absolutely love spending time with my grandkids. And I always say it keeps me young. I absolutely cherish that time. 
and I think I have a different perspective on, on what fun is, and you get to take that time to do it. Like I said, it just gives you a sense of purpose. So the Icaria, Greece, and I'm going to kind of hop down to number four there, those people live eight years longer uh, than, than most uh, people. They have half the heart disease and really barely any dementia at all. Uh, this is, uh, an, they're at Icaria, Greece, or Icaria. I always want to, I've, I've got it hid in my head that it's Icaria, but I was corrected. And um, it's actually one of the Aegean islands. Uh, Sardinia, Italy has actually uh, the most male centurions, and Okinawa, Japan, has the most female. And a lot of the reason for that female, and they, what they claim is that they have their circle of friends. It's a very tight-knit circle of friends that's really important to them. But what they all have in common is diet, is, their, is that nutrition. They are all areas that have a lot of fresh produce. They tend to eat more seafood. They don't eat as much meat. It's actually, uh, overall, much less meat um, than what we proportion on our plates. Uh, they tend to eat more of the beans and legumes. They eat more of a Mediterranean diet. And when we talk about Parkinson's disease, that is the suggested diet, lifestyle is more of a Mediterranean, or what I, I tend to talk about too is an anti-inflammatory diet. And they're very actually similar. So I'm going to go into, because I want to make sure that I get time for questions here. Obviously you are what you eat, right? So think about what you're eating in a month. Think about when you go grocery shopping and uh, what you're putting in your cart. And uh, I think that a lot of us, if we really would look at that, we'd find that there are a lot of fillers, there are a lot of preservatives, uh, there's a lot of refined sugars, a lot of processed foods. And that is, and we do that for convenience, or we use those for convenience, and it's added for extended life, uh, shelf life. The problem is, most of those foods cause inflammation. So when you're shopping, what I want you to think about is shopping more of that perimeter of the store. When you walk in, you hit the produce. Even if, uh, even it's, if it's frozen, it's uh, less degraded nutritionally uh, than even the canned foods. Um, the best foods and the best, like I said, uh, uh, recipes tend to be Mediterranean. A lot of times when I talk to people about this, they go, I don't know what that means. I, I need recipes. I can't just, you know, change this over because my husband, he really likes steak and, you know, meat and potatoes. So this is going to be a really big change. And what I tell people is, know yourself, okay? If you think about your successes or failures on past diet changes. You know, what, what made you fail? Did you go all in? On Tuesday, I had a patient who came in, and I had talked to them um, the prior visit about some nutritional changes that I really wanted them to make. Well, and I mentioned the Mediterranean diet. Well, they went home and they researched, and they went all in for a week, and then he kind of crashed. And I said, that's not everybody. Some people are very black and white, and other people need to start slow and kind of wean in some foods that are brain healthy and wean out the bad ones. So even if somebody's just picking one at a time and going, I'm going to really look at these refined sugars. I'm going to know what they are. I'm going to start looking at my packages, and I'm going to start pulling those out. I had one fellow in particular that did that. And he came in, I actually didn't recognize him in the waiting room because he lost 60 pounds. He looked fantastic, but I actually didn't recognize him. So it can be very effective. And he felt great. He had felt, he's actually a pro fisherman. And um, he said he had, he had felt better than he had in many, many years. I don't think it's ever too late to change this either. Um, from my standpoint, when I am thinking about who I should talk to about this, it's really everybody. 
there are a few people that I think a little bit more urgently about. And those are people um, who are displaying early symptoms of maybe red flags that I say that we know in movement disorders that uh, could be potential flags for dementia. And uh, I know Dr. Leo covered like REM sleep disorder. REM sleep disorder has been linked as an early symptom of a possible dementia. So if you're having that problem with uh, acting, a lot out, uh, acting out a lot in your dreams, that is something that I go, hmm, you know, we really need to talk and take a look at uh, the amount of inflammation. And I'll explain a little bit later, there are actually some labs that I tend to do in, and uh, follow so that when you're making these nutritional changes, I can see inflammatory markers going down. It's something I'm kind of tracking. I think we don't, I think we can't just do it and assume it's working. So it is something that I'm kind of tracking. Also, you know, early, early signs of possible dementia can be hallucinations as well. Sometimes it's just a one-time incident. Uh, sometimes it's more than that. But again, I don't want to wait that long. I, I want to head it off at the pass. So it really is a discussion to have for everybody. So the Mediterranean diet, how many of you have heard of it? Have you heard it? Oh, yeah, everybody has. How many of you follow it? <laughs> yeah, much less, yeah. I, you know, and we'll talk maybe a little later at question and answer. I'm, I'm curious as to why, you know, if it seems difficult. Um, but this is just kind of covering some of the data that's out there. Uh, the Europeans are much better at following the Mediterranean type diet than what we are. Um, but overall, there is definitely data on improvement in cognition as well as memory retention. And um, I think that you've got that with you. I'm not going to repeat everything that's on my slide because we've got so much to go over. Um, I wanted to kind of cover some of these, what I deem as brainiac foods. And at my table outside the door, we'll cover that at the end, there, there are a number of Mediterranean diet cookbooks. There are an anti-inflammatory cookbooks. I've got one uh, on Alzheimer's and food and particular nutrients that are, that are healthy for you to, or foods and nutrients that are he healthy for you to incorporate into your uh, daily eating that hopefully will help support what I'm talking about and give you an idea. If you need, you need more help in saying, I need a cookbook, or I need, a, you know, a, I need some recipes that I can do this with, or my husband or my wife is not going to eat this. The big key is that you do it together. I mean, it's really hard to uh, have somebody in the household that's diabetic and somebody that's not. It's hard. To, you're not going to cook two meals, and it's really obviously something in this case that's going to support brain health for everybody. So I, it, you really need to do it and support each other together and make it a total lifestyle change. Um, so we'll cover some of these brainiac foods. Most of you kind of know some of this, but you might not know the reason behind it or what nutrients you know, uh, they actually give. So your dark leafy green vegetables, that's like your kale and um, your spinach, uh, they are all uh, things that uh, when you're shopping, I had one woman come up to my booth today and goes, she said, you know what, it's been, and I just started eating kale. I said, well, why did, you, why did you incorporate kale in your diet? She goes, I had never had it before. I decided it's time to try something new. I even tried kiwi and I liked it, you know. So there's sometimes just baby steps in saying, I might not have ever tried this before, but I'm going to be open to it. And I think it does take an open mind to a lot of these foods. You might not be necessarily familiar with it. That's the case also with uh, Mediterranean diet or anti-inflammatory diet cookbooks. Um, people go, I, I, I know I need to know the one. And I said, well, it'll depend on you because you might not want to cook for an hour. You might want 20 minute, 30 minute meals. Um, the ingredients, you're going to have to take a look in that book and go, I can find this at my store or not, or would I even eat that? I don't eat that, or do I have any food allergies? So you're going to look at cookbooks very differently um, than the next person would. So 
I tend to tell people that it's really more important to know about which foods to incorporate so that you can put them into recipes. So people today also came up to me and said, well, what about gluten-free? I hate the taste, but I know it's good for me. And a lot of that is about trying, uh, trying any products and seeing if you can incorporate it into uh, recipes, even if they are your favorite recipes and not necessarily find, uh, fi uh, following a cookbook. Personally, I'm not good with recipes. Uh, I tend to a little pinch of this, a little pinch of that. Uh, I wing recipes a lot, but I love cooking. So uh, I do use a lot of fresh ingredients. I grow tons of my own herbs. Um, I just find that it's more palatable than the dry herbs. Um, and there are a ton of health benefits with fresh herbs as well. So wild Alaskan salmon, we're talking king salmon. Um, and you want it wild caught, not farm raised. Um, these have these long chain omega-3 fatty acids. And so there are all kinds of you know, omega acids. There's omega-6, there's omega-3. The problem with our diet now is we have so much omega-6, um, we don't want that. We want more omega-3. We want that to be a higher on the scale than the, uh, than the omega-6. But our current normal diet is very high in omega-6 as opposed to omega-3. So it kind of cancels out anything that you're eating. Uh, so uh, look for wild-caught uh, Alaskan salmon. They even, I'm actually amazed now at Aldi and how much they have there that really fits with the Mediterranean diet and is reasonable in price because that tends to be an issue with people when they're looking at this is go, it's really expensive to eat fresh. And I'm like, well, not really. If you're, you know, the health benefits, you don't have the doctor bills, you're not using more pills and things like that. So you really have to plan ahead and, and really follow it. Avocados. How many of you eat avocados? Yeah, good. So that's a healthy fat. And when you eat avocados with other vegetables, the avocado helps you to absorb those nutrients from those other vegetables even more. Um, so like I said, you, you really want to eat and incorporate an avocado into your day, one whole avocado into your day if you can do it. So if you don't like avocados, that might be stretching the taffy a little bit, but hopefully you can incorporate it. There are many different recipes you can use. Um, I tend to do a lot of kind of Greek food, and um, I definitely uh, like my avocados. I tend to use like cucumber and... Uh, and tomatoes and avocado and feta cheese and some fresh dill and, um, and use that even on some sprouted bread or with an egg in the morning. So um, it, you, can, you can find many different recipes. Uh, blueberries. These are really high in antioxidants. Antioxidants are what your body needs to fight off what are called free radicals. Um, you don't want free radicals you want your diet to be high in an antioxidants. Um, extra virgin olive oil, or EVOO as it's now termed. Um, obviously, uh, most people are more familiar with it, I think, than what they used to be. And I'm gonna go a little bit later into kind of your good oils, bad oils, good fats, bad fats. Um, eggs, boy, the egg dilemma. We've had eggs are good, eggs are bad, uh, dilemma for eons. And um, at this time, eggs are good. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> and, and, and it really depends on what you read, I'll be quite honest with you. Um, but it is something that uh, has, is high in acetylcholine. And so uh, I definitely absolutely love eggs. I could never be a vegan. Uh, Grass-fed beef, so this is, uh, when we think about that term, you are what you eat, um, we do want you to, when we're talking about inflammation, limit the amount of red meats. It doesn't mean you can't eat any, okay? And I actually had this conversation with a cattle farmer. <laughs> so it was an interesting visit, but he was very open to listening to me about it. And he, and he understood the concept. 
When um, we're talking about, and I'm going to get into it a little bit more later, about grains, grains tend to cause more inflammation. So if you've got cows that are eating grains, um, you will have more inflammation. So grass-fed, grass-finished uh, beef is really what would be better for you to decrease inflammation. Um, it has more of that omega-3 versus the omega-6. Um, Cruciferous vegetables, that's like your broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, kale, bok choy, um, arugula, and radishes. And, I mean, broccoli is a really good one, so if you want to incorporate more of those. Um, so those, those vegetables help to mop up those free radicals in the brain. Dark chocolate. See? I told you I'd give you a little break, right? You're actually supposed to eat a whole dark chocolate bar each week. I know that doesn't sound like a lot, right? Um, dark chocolate, when I'm talking, you know, how dark, it really, ha it should be 80% cocoa um, or more. So it's a pretty dark chocolate, but um, so that's, that's the break you get. There's fruit, you can do that with raspberries or something, you know, so. Uh, nuts, obviously they're very healthy, they're antioxidant, they're a great source of vitamin E. Vitamin E is very good for memory. And when we're talking about nuts, it's really a variety of nuts, but actually pistachios are one of the healthiest. But any, any nuts, if you need a snack, like I tend to keep out on my, on my counter, I'll have like a bowl of cherries and um, uh, you know, a, a trail mix. I've got a really good one that I tend to like and, and pick up that has like walnuts and almonds and uh, pecans and, and pistachios and things that I keep out for that snack. Because otherwise, what do we do? We go to the cupboard, we go to the refrigerator, and we pick out some bad snacks. And even my grandkids, when they come over, they'll nibble off of that stuff on the counter because sometimes we just do it out of boredom. So I try to make sure that I keep handy, healthy snacks. So, feeble foods. <laughs> um, these are foods that tend to gum up the brain, okay? We're gonna talk about grains, and I told you I love bread. I really love bread. So, do I eat bread? I do eat bread. I don't, I haven't given it up completely. I haven't, like, gone, uh, you know, I, I, I like bread, I really do. So, but I really pick out things that are better for me. I'll do more of like a sprouted bread. Have you ever heard of sprouted bread? That's really when the energy from the grain um, causes it to sprout. And so the less of it um, is, less of it is used in the body uh, to increase your blood sugars. And what our goal is here, and a lot of that link between Alzheimer's disease and diabetes is about these bursts of uh, carbohydrates or sugars um, in our bloodstream, and so the goal is to eat foods that are longer, longer acting sugars so that you maintain a uh, steadier blood sugar level. And so that's where you really wanna watch these grains and make sure that uh, if you are, need a gluten-free diet, absolutely you can do that. Um, I know that really is what's promoted, but I don't do a total gluten-free diet. Um, some people uh, definitely kinda stick to that, that's my, that's my crutch, so. Um, and like I said, I think it's really about working in what's doable for us and palatable for us. 40% um, of, of Alzheimer's cases can be owed to elevated insulin, um, which actually begins decades before diagnosis, okay? So a lot of this is about lifestyle long-term lifestyle changes and, and its effect on the body. You should really stop eating two to three hours before bedtime. And that optimizes the, uh, the, the reducing of the insulin in, in the body. So refined sugars, we kind of talked about that. Again, our goal is that, it, you know, that we are reducing that insulin spike in the body, okay? Um, because increased sugar equals in, increased glyc uh, glycation, and that is equal to increased dementia. So kind of look at your pantry, purge your pantry. 
I have a blog that I do, a brain health blog that I do, and that's my next article, Purge Your Pantry. And it's really about looking at those labels. You can see here are some of the hidden offenders. Now, does that mean you can't eat any sugar? I mean, because food's going to be pretty awful if you have none. I think you've got to pick and choose in, in your battles. For me, I, I, I'm a beekeeper, so do I not eat honey? No, I eat honey because that's why I raise bees. And um, so, but bees also have antibacterial, or honey's, honey has antibacterial properties and some other health benefits too. So if I'm gonna pick between that and cane sugar, I'm gonna pick my honey or uh, maple syrup or something like that. So it, it really is about not getting rid of it necessarily completely so that food tastes awful, but reducing it down, taking a look at those labels and having an idea of what it does to our body. Uh, fructose, when you're looking at fructose, I had my grandkids over and they, they always complain if I give them pure maple syrup. They don't, supposedly don't like it. Well, I kind of tricked them this week and, uh, and they ate it anyway. And I looked at the bottle of the log cabin that they wanted and it says no high fructose corn syrup. And then you flip over the bottle and it said fructose, water, sugar. You know, I'm like, hmm, I don't know about that. I don't know if that's true labeling there. Um, so let's talk briefly about uh, cheap oils, um, bad, bad fats. When we are talking about uh, bad oils, they cause increased oxidation. The higher the heat that you use, the more that they actually uh, change the composition of those oils. So you really want to kind of reduce down your uh, temperature when you're cooking and cook things at lower heat. And uh, pick fats that are... Uh, healthier for your body. And that is when we're talking about your extra virgin olive oil, coconut oil. Um, you can, if, you, if you're eating butter and eat butter for um, anything, you can use uh, Irish butter, which is a grass-fed butter. Um, and that actually is better for you than the typicals. You just want to avoid like canola oil, corn oil, peanut oil, and you've got that whole list. Um, and uh, you can also use avocado oil, which is very healthy as well. So, I know I don't have that much time left, so. Uh, nutritional supplements. Glutathione. I have many people, not a lot, but some people that come in and they want to know. Glutathione is something that they heard of is, that is our kind of master antioxidant in our body. And they've heard of, you know, IV treatments or pills that are glutathione and whether or not, uh, you know, they could take these to improve, you know, their memory and things. I guess my biggest take home is, with any supplements, if you don't like taking pills, why are you taking supplements then to get it when, when you could get it from your diet? So your body always absorbs things better when it's natural and comes uh, naturally from the foods that you eat. Um, so glutathione is found in fish, poultry, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, uh, cauliflower, kale, um, mustard greens and watercress. So those are some of the foods that if you really want to have the powerhouse antioxidant that you should be working on incorporating into your diet. Homocysteine. This is a, a, a lab or, a, or a, an, a marker of inflammation. There's a lot of research out there about higher homocysteine levels and their relationship to dementia. And I actually have uh, one book in particular at my table that's written by uh, Laura Mishley. And she does, all of her research is in nutrition and Parkinson's disease. And um, she has a website too that you can go to to kind of register and track your, your nutrition. And uh, so homocysteine is a inflammatory marker. Some of you have heard of one called like a sed rate, which is uh, a a way that we can track in your bloodstream how much inflammation is there. Well, you can track it with a homocysteine level too. So one of the things that I'm doing, and this is just something personal I do in my own practice, it's not standardized, is monitoring that link because when you are trying to eat an, an anti-inflammatory diet or a Mediterranean type diet, our goal is to lower that inflammation level, right? And so this, for me, is a tracking mechanism. Anything above 10 is high with homocysteine. I've only had one person that is lower than 10. One person. 
everybody else, and so that higher homocysteine level uh, has that potential for uh, increase in dementia. So our goal when we're tracking this, and it's a little bit of accountability, the hard part about telling people about changing their nutrition or their diet is follow through. How do I know they're doing it? It's really about them reporting back to me and knowing that we're trying to track this and actually see if we can change this level. Is it coming down? Are we able to, to see that these inflammatory markers are coming down with that uh, nutritional change? And I think it's important to be able to kind of see things work. Um, and that is based on a lot of her research, actually. I was actually impressed. I had a patient recently that came to me from Arizona and had a, uh, they, had, they are snowbirds, and so they go to Arizona every six months. And I had sent them to see a provider uh, down there if they needed to intermittently. And they came back and they had labs and they were running homocysteine levels there too, which I was really impressed with because most people um, don't track it whatsoever. Um, choline, choline uh, is neuroprotective. And so uh, it's also used for neuro repair. Now, uh, it's found in egg yolks. That's why I said yada, yada eggs, um, soy, wheat germ, and, um, and liver. So if you don't like liver, go, to, go with the egg yolks. Um, Prevagen, I just put this in here briefly because I have a number of patients that come in to me when we're talking about supplements that say, well, I'm on Prevagen, and really the data is not there. I really would prefer it if you uh, don't. Uh, you know, use Prevagen because the data doesn't support it all. And actually, they're under investigation right now by the FDA um, for, um, for that. They're actually, because it's actually an unapproved drug, and um, they, uh, so they're under investigation, and they had a lot of adverse events that weren't, weren't reported. So don't use Prevagen. So, summary, make it nutritious. High in fiber. We want to increase those antioxidants, so you want your uh, brightly colored. A lot of times I tell people, eat from a rainbow. If you think about the soil that you plant your food in, you want it to be dark and rich. Well, the food that comes from that soil should be the really nutritious stuff is dark and rich too. So your eggplants, your uh, cherries, uh, blueberries, uh, green leafy vegetables, the darker in color, the more nutritious so, nutritious. so if you're going in and you're picking and choosing, and we all have choices, eat from a rainbow. Um, green and black tea. There's a lot of research that you should be drinking three glasses of either green or black tea. There was a little dilemma on which one's better, but either one um, are really good antioxidants as well. Beans and legumes, uh, the fish that we covered. So you want to... You wanna, really watch how much protein you're consuming. For some of you, you want to watch that, uh, how much protein you're consuming, especially with your dose of carbidopa levodopa, because too much protein can uh, slow the absorption. One of the other main issues with a lot of this dietary changes is constipation. Most people from, with Parkinson's deal with uh, slowed gut motility and problems with constipation. You'll be amazed when you change your diet into something like this and you have less processed and refined foods, how much better your gut motility is and how much um, better you're going to absorb nutrients as well as your medications. I'm not going to cover all of this, oh, except for the fact that you also do get to have a glass of red wine. Okay, that's important to know. <laughs> and eliminate uh, pesticides as much as you can. Uh, and go, you know, more organic. Now, there are certain vegetables that tend to be on a list. It's not everything, so there's a lot of false advertising on, on organic and things. There are certain vegetables that are more prone to uh, pesticide use and aren't as clean. So, um, and again, I have uh, a blog that I do. It's called, and it's at my table too, um, it's called rocktheages.com. And I do that because when I'm trying to teach my patients in the clinic, sometimes it can be overwhelming, the information. And so it's really a support piece for me to be able to say to them, you know what, I'm going to do you know, an article or something about that so that you have it, and you can check in on it at your own rate and your own time. And if you have to look back and say, well, why is it she told me to incorporate that food you know, in or out of my diet? 
it's really a nice way to be able to have people reference um, any data material. And I definitely try to put my sources on there because I'm a researcher, I want you to be a researcher. Look at the data yourself, you know, but sometimes it's hard to find that. And this is scientific data. This isn't just, um, you know, some author, you know, uh, saying that they are writing a book. This is all scientific-based research that I try to link you to. So um, I have cards at my table uh, for that uh, blog site if you want it, but otherwise it's rocktheages.com. And I speak a lot, so I haven't written a lot lately, but my, my winter months tend to be a little bit freer for adding more information to that. I have also at my table a number of books that um, talk about um, health and, and brain health and Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's disease. I also have recipe books there. And um, I invite you to come take a look. It's outside the door to your left at the very end of the hall. So feel free to browse the table for titles. You can take a picture with your phone if you find one that you like and then order it. Um, or just write it down. I've got some pads there that if you find something that's interesting, write the title down so that you can find it at your local bookstore um, or read it. So I'm going to end with that. And we have a we, little bit of time for questions. We, so okay. raise your hand. Um, and as best you can, make it um, brief so we can get as many in before lunch. What's the length of time of your initial interview with your clients? And then subsequently, how often do you see them? And how do you document your services for our lovely insurance peeps to cover <laughs> your service for your clients? Thank you. Yep. So um, the first question was, you know, how, off, how long are my visits? So my initial visit for either diagnosis or just to reestablish care or whatever is an hour. Uh, my follow-up visits are 30 minutes. And it depends on the patient with uh, how often I follow up. If I'm going to make a medication change, I'm going to follow up. If I can't see them quickly because I'm kind of booked out, um, then I have them give me a phone report in a week or two. That way we're connecting um, because I don't like them to go too long. And usually I tell people, give me a percentage of improvement. I literally write down on paper, it should be easier to get out of the chair. It should be, um, your legs shouldn't feel so heavy. Um, very specific symptoms that we're looking at for goal of improvement, and then um, give, give me that phone report, and then otherwise I follow up with somebody very stable, usually every three to four months. Uh, the billing, as far as, what w I guess I don't know your question on that. Oh, well, I don't really have problems. Yeah, it's really just about being comprehensive in your notes, you know, and that's really just about describing the issues at hand and, yeah, so I don't really have an issue with that. Mm -hmm. um, on the homocysteine slide, mm -hmm. there was some mention on about folic acid, vitamin B12, and mm -hmm. vitamin B6. Mm -hmm. Are you suggesting those? What, uh, what's well, and so it, the homocysteine there are homocysteine supplements or tablets, and that, those are the ingredients in that homocysteine tablet. So one of the other things that we look at a lot in neurology are like those B vitamins. Those B vitamins are neurologic um, repair vitamins. And so it is something, along with like vitamin D and things like that, we have to track those to know if you're deficient, to know if you need supplementation. I don't want people just running out and buying them because it depends on whether or not they're fat-soluble vitamins or water-soluble vitamins. Some people can be toxic if you take too much vitamin D. That's a fat-soluble vitamin. And so you really want to know the levels of those. So again, that's also something I track before when I'm doing the homocysteine level. I'm also tracking the, the B vitamins as well as the folic acid. But Regarding supplements, um, how do you know if they're Good supplements or bad? I hear there's a lot of variety yeah. there. That's a good question. So, how, how do you know if there's good or bad? You know, they're good or bad supplements. You, uh, it's not tracked by the FDA. Um, Nature Made is a brand that um, allows or, or releases its information to the FDA for tracking. So I tend to go with them because they're transparent. 
Um, but otherwise, you're right. You don't know if you're getting good quality fish oil and things like that. So um, a lot of it is about, uh, A, even, if, even with fish oil, making sure that, like the one that I take is a, is a, a wild-caught salmon fish oil, you know, because I know the data, so I will always make sure that that's kind of, that's something that I'm getting. Um, but I do tend to, tech, tend to recommend Nature Made. Hi, uh, you talked a lot about uh, uh, vegetables and uh, fish and things like that. I'm surprised that you didn't mention more about fruit. What about apples, oranges, berries, things like that? How do they fit in? Yeah, they're good too, but again, um, they break down into more sugars, so you just have to watch that distribution. Um, again, you know, and you can't cover everything. I could talk forever about this, you know, unfortunately. I think that we are more, we're, we're better at adding fruit in our diet than we are vegetables, and those vegetables are so much um, more nutritious. But definitely, I did talk about, you know, cherries. Cherries are very high anti-inflammatory. Uh, blueberries, definitely things. That's why I said eat from a rainbow. Think about those dark colors that applies totally to fruit as well. But we just want to watch the sugars, the sugars that, um, you know, that they break down into. What are your thoughts on dairy? So dairy, you know, obviously that's another source of protein. So those people who are very sensitive to like on and off periods and things like that, they need to watch the dairy, especially around mid-dose time. But um, yeah, one of the things I didn't mention and I didn't really get into is those prebiotics and probiotics, now that I think about it. Um, and when we're talking about probiotics, we're talking about Greek yogurt and things like that. So you got to pick, you know, you pick your evils, you know, and your um, positive um, uh, ingredients wisely. Um, what are your, is your opinion on celery juicing? On juicing celery, juicing, you mean? Juicing, yes. I, I love juicing. I do it myself, too. Not necessarily just celery juicing, and I know where you're, what you're talking about with that. Um, but the only problem with, I mean, it's great, especially for me, if I've got leftover veggies, even though I tend to throw them on the grill, but if I have leftover veggies and I'm going, and I, and I want to juice, and I've got a juice maker, um, but you also lose the fiber in a lot of those uh, if you would eat it raw, but you can obviously compact a lot more uh, uh, veggies into a day in juicing compared to what you would necessarily sit down to eat. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm talking, uh, basically the theory is that you should cut back on red meat, mm -hmm. but then there was also that uh, the white, the chicken, and the uh, uh, pork would be better. Lately there's been studies now that say that there's no difference in the meats. Uh, should we be cutting back on the, the non-red meats as well? And again, a lot of that is based more on whether it's grass or grain fed. You know, it is about the proteins, but it's also about whether or not it's grass or grain fed. And so, like I have, for me, I mean, do I eat red meat? You know, I, I do eat some red meat, but I do have a, a local farmer who has grass fed, uh, grass fed animals, you know what I mean, that, that I get mine from. And so, uh, you know, and like I said, everybody's a little bit different. I want to really point out that that's where the counseling comes in is you have to work with what people will do as well. Like I said, I talked to this cattle farmer. I'm like, am I going to get him to not eat red meat? No, not at all. Of course not. It's really about just applying the knowledge um, to the person and making sure that you can start to incorporate um, those changes. Not sure how to ask this. Mm -hmm. I know, obviously, raw vegetable is more nutritious mm -hmm. than cooked, but... Do you do both, or...? You can, absolutely. I mean, some people don't like one or the other, you know, and if I'm telling you to, you're not going to eat it otherwise, right? So if you can whip it up in a skillet at low, you know, at a lower temperature with extra virgin olive oil and add some herbs and all that kind of stuff and it's palatable to you and you don't mind it cooked, absolutely. You know, fresh, uh, obviously, ha you haven't lost any nutrients, you know, from eating it uh, fresh. But that's not necessarily realistic for people. You're going to cook it up as well. And, of course, most recipes are cooking it. All right. Let's thank Daisy for her time. Yeah. Thank, you. Um, thank you. They are going to be, they are going to be starting lunch.
um, right next door in C. So um, get yourselves uh, settled in there and we'll get started. Find that. That's, 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 that's fine. 